I'd like to thank everybody for coming here for the talk today on our Skyline GTR R34. We have two very knowledgeable gentlemen speaking today that will tell you not only the story of this car, but of the line itself and the history and its specs and a lot of very good information. My name is Chris Gergen. I'm the executive director here at the museum. And it's, uh, it is an honor to have you all here to listen to this. Let me introduce first Kenneth Hay and Zane Evans, and they will be doing the talk today. So we're going to talk today about the lineage that is the Nissan GTR. Okay, and it obviously started with the original Skyline in 1957, owned and started by the Prince Company before Nissan bought them. But the GTR badge first started in 1971 with what is commonly referred to as the Hakasuka, or the box Skyline, which would be this one. <clears throat> it wasn't really super popular. It started in 1969, but it, in 71, it came out as the two-door, which was the start of really the top of the line GTRs. It was powered by a two liter, 160 horsepower engine that dominated its racing class. It was breathtaking and revolutionary at its time and when it started. It weighed next to nothing at just over 2,000 pounds. And then the Skyline got stagnant for a while. The next uh, Skyline in the generation was referred to as the Ken Miri, uh, which was very brief and not very commercially successful. Uh, and then it kind of died for a while. And then came the 1989 R32 GTR. Now, before we go into this, we have to, of course, mention what is commonly referred to in the JDM or Japanese domestic market as the gentleman's agreement that was entered into by all the major Japanese manufacturers right around 1987 to 88. <clears throat> this gentleman's agreement was a coming together of all the major manufacturers where they decided in order to have a fair market competition, they decided that each branch, each manufacturer could design, engineer, produce, and race whatever they wanted. You can come up with any technology you want. You can push the boundaries in any way you want. But in order to make it fair, we're going to all agree that we will only market that these cars make a max of 276 horsepower. They're not. They're going to make more. We're just going to lie about it. We're just going to lie about it. We're going to tell you that it makes 276 and it can make more. Who cares? But that's what we're going to tell everybody so that everybody thinks we're playing fair. So when the R32 GTR debuted in 1989 with the same engine that is in this, the RB26 DETT or twin turbo, it was a 2.6 liter twin turbo that made 276 horsepower. It didn't. Most people uh, believe that they made somewhere in the vicinity, especially in the R32s of about 300. Uh, and then in later generations, and in this car, Zane will tell you later that they made considerably more. This, this car was entered into every race when it started in the Japanese Altering Championship, and it won 29 straight races. It was so dominant with its all-wheel drive system that the governing body decided to outlaw the car because Toyota, basically Toyota, started complaining that nobody could win. Nobody could win. Not only did they win, they got first, second, third, and in most occasions they were the top five of those 29 races. So Toyota and then later on Mazda also jumped in on that saying that it's not fair, we can't compete, we need to change the rules. So they did. Later on they went to the R33 GTR which changed the body into something a little bit softer. The R32 was considered very, very hard. It was very aggressive. It was very lightweight. So they made the R33 a little wider, a little softer, and a lot heavier. Their market analysis showed that probably wasn't the best move. So they decided to change it a little bit. And then they made this. Now, before we go on to this, 
the one thing that the R32 really, really did to kind of change and set the tone for what the GTR name stood for was the Godzilla moniker. Now, when the R32 made its international debut, they took it to the Bathurst 1000 in Australia, which had always been dominated by Ford versus Holden. In Australia, you're either a Ford guy or you're a Holden guy. That's it. And when an Australian team showed up with an inline six Nissan, everybody laughed at them. And when they destroyed the big V8s, the Australian teams told them, and I'm gonna quote them here, said to take their mythical monster back to Japan. Because we didn't want it. So they actually nicknamed it Godzilla in Japan, and the name stuck. So this is the probably the best rendition of Godzilla. Uh, and for that, I'm going to hand over the mic to Zane, uh, who previously owned this car. Uh, so yeah, like he says, it's previously my car. Uh, if you ask my kids, it still is my car. It's my race car. Um, it's an unbelievable car to drive. It's, it's kind of hard to explain. Um, it's known as one of the most technologically advanced cars of its time, but yet it still feels very mechanical. Uh, your steering is very tight. Um, well, and the whole GTR badge is based off of racing. The whole thing is set for street racing, essentially. Um, one of the biggest, why it's known in America, uh, a lot of, you know, the generation of playing video games, this was like the elite car in like your Gran Turismo sport games and your racing games. Uh, and then it also really came to fame with uh, the Fast and Furious franchise, uh, which is where I personally know it the best. Uh, I didn't play too many games back then. Um, again, like I said, it's, it's based off of, or basically is the most technologically advanced car of its time. Um, you have many things. So previous to the R34, uh, all your turbos, the exhaust side was a ceramic, uh, turbine. And so being a small displacement motor, it revved to the moon. These things were designed to rev up to 8,000 and just love it um, and so when it came to the r34 they went with uh, metal turbines all the way through stop doing the ceramic a lot of times if you hung out at 8,000 for a long time it would just snap off and nobody likes a car without turbos when it's supposed to have them so um, one of the other big things is it is uh, individual throttle body uh, car uh, which is gives it a lot more response uh, it's more instant. A lot of times with these cars, when you get into like big tuning and trying to get major power out of them, they'll throw in, uh, just a big single throttle body. But uh, it's kind of like an iconic thing, what it's kind of known for. Um, the Sorry, I keep looking back for notes. Um, one of the notice or the biggest things for the R34 was the uh, multifunction display screen. And after the demonstration, if you get up there and kind of look at it, it's right in the top center console. And it's just a, a big screen. And most of the time, I had it set up like this, uh, where you can kind of get you know, your, your boost pressure, your oil pressure, injector, um, like your duty cycle. Uh, you can, kind of monitors everything. Uh, this is still something that gets used in a lot of cars nowadays. But back in 1999, it was kind of unheard of. Um, we had, well, and so I'll get into the Nismo branch as well, um, which Nismo was Nissan's performance, uh, department essentially. So this car doesn't have it, but they even had G sensors. So you could monitor everything, keep track of everything. Um, go from there. You could set your lap times, anything you wanted, and they would keep track of it for 30 seconds. So you could see the graph going up and down, kind of have some fun and see how much I mean, geez, you could pull, I guess. Um, you could break this down to where it had individual if you wanted to just look at two or one of them and keep track of that. Uh, my kid's favorite part about this car is on the multifunction display, 
there's actually a TV button. And right now, if you turn it on, you push the button, you just get a bunch of like Japanese words and I have no idea what any of it means. But in Japan, if you were next to like a radio station or television station, you could actually watch TV on the car, which was kind of cool. Um, and actually the radio, if you, it won't pick up any radio stations here because it's also still set up for Japan's frequencies. Um, yeah. Uh, another big part of the car, and I'll, I'll kind of walk through and do some of them. Most of this stuff is underneath and you can't really see it. Um, but you had the Atessa system, which was the all wheel drive system. So when you get to a V spec, it gives you limited slip differentials. Um, the car has three of them front, back, and then one at the transfer case. Uh, it can distribute power 50 50, depending on what you need to do. Um, the car is essentially a year round street race car. I mean, I never drove it in the snow. I wouldn't dare to, but it would do just fine uh, if you had some different tires on. But it's designed to be anywhere, everywhere, year round, daily driven, just monster or Godzilla. Um, the Hikus system. Uh, the Hikus system is a rear steering component of the car. A lot of the older generations, the R32s, R33s, uh, they all ran off hydraulic system. Uh, the R34, they advanced it, turned it more electrical. So now it's got electrical solenoids on the back. And what it does is when you're driving slow and you turn right, your back wheels will turn left one degree to help you turn sharper. When you're at a higher speed, if you're on the highway or something like that, if you turn right, the back wheels will also turn right. So that way you're more stable. Um, it is one of the like most known things about the Skyline. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people actually deleted them just because once you get into a major racing uh, component, or I, I guess surrounding, um, it was kind of unpredictable on when it would agree to turn right and when it would agree to turn left. Now granted, it, it only turns one degree, so not much at all, um, but it was kind of unpredictable and they couldn't really tune it out and so they just kind of deleted them. Uh, this car still has it. It's kind of a, you gotta get way down there to kind of see it. Um, and then I also, the rear splitter is kind of also in the way. Uh, which I don't have that up here, but if you do notice you have a, a full carbon dry carbon rear splitter and That basically runs from the very back of the car to about here And it's basically just designed to as the air is coming under the car to kind of speed it out and shoot it out the back And what that does is it acts like a spoiler and it just sucks the back of the car down that way you have more traction higher speeds um, very fun car they it kind of throws you off because when you if you lift up the back of the car there's like a metal hockey puck under there and you're supposed to lift directly from that and it kind of bends the carbon and makes you a little queasy because you just don't want to break anything um, so i have some more stuff i can talk about uh, but one of the biggest eye catches to the car is the paint uh, it's called midnight purple 2 they uh, had a midnight purple one as well, and it was just a, a glossy purple uh, that was on like the R32s and R33s. The midnight purple two, uh, it's extremely hard to get light to kind of explain what it is. You have to walk around the whole car. Um, sometimes when the sun's hitting it just right, it's bright orange. Sometimes uh, when the sun's hitting it almost directly, it's green. Um, as you walk by, you can kind of see how it'll change a little bit. It'll be purple, green, blue, kind of everything. Um, I always kind of, well, I have some pictures with it, like at night with the sunset being all beautiful, and it's like all the colors went to the sky because at night the car looks black. And so that's kind of my favorite way to explain it is it's, it's just a, a sunset, essentially, of colors. Nissan advertised saying that they were only going to make 300. Um, I believe the actual count is 342. Um, only 282 of them came in the V-spec trim. 
Um, the V-Spec trim was more of a racier trim level. Came with uh, better brakes, a uh, little bit better tune, stuff like that. One of the big things with the R34 is they're essentially illegal to have in the United States. Um, North America, so the United States, Canada, Nissan didn't make them to EPA and DOT standards. So they didn't pass emissions, they didn't pass crash tests, um, anything like that. And Nissan didn't really care. Uh, they had them everywhere, including New Zealand. I mean, anywhere you wanted. They, uh, one of the other cool things is this uh, red light here is actually a fog light to make the car legal in Europe. And, and so they did little things here and there, but we couldn't get them here. And as Americans, we want what we can't have. And so uh, they started making, uh, actually it was Bill Gates that did it. He uh, tried to import a Porsche that was illegal. And when it got to the docks, they said, hey, you can't have this. And well, Bill Gates has a ton of money. And so he got some politics behind it and they made up the show and display law. Essentially makes, uh, you can apply to have your car on the list uh, for the R34, there's two variants. Uh, this is probably the most common one. Basically, it has to be a 99 uh, R34 V-Spec in Midnight Purple 2. Very specific because it only has 282 made. So it has to be a show car, essentially. Um, luckily, we qualify. Uh, so basically, if this car was white, it wouldn't be here. We'd be talking about a different car. Uh, or it would be, I don't know, they'd take it. Uh, Florida actually just got in trouble uh, big time because they had like over 400 uh, titles get taken away of cars that had been legally or illegally imported. And so there were a couple R34s that were on that list, which is sad for me because... It's an extreme unicorn car. Um, the production year of these cars, there it was 99 to 2002 was the main production time frame. They only made 11,400 cars. And so there's not many. Cars have been around for 21, 22 years. Um, and so anyone that gets taken away is just one less you'll ever see. Um, I honestly never thought I'd get to see one of these cars and so it was always really fun um yeah a little side note the uh paint was actually named after uh japan's uh, midnight club or midnight racing club uh which is an awesome story i recommend you guys checking into that if you're interested uh it was basically a group of very wealthy men basically or, or women, whatever, um, CEOs of companies, and they would make the most tuned extreme cars and do 200 mile an hour down the road for 50 miles. I mean, these things were insane. You know, in, in the 90s, um, basically, if you figured out who was an owner or who was in the club, that person was no longer allowed to be in the club. And so the whole thing was very top secret. Nobody really knows who was or wasn't in the club, but the cars are pretty famous as they have them on you know, security cameras going 200 down the highway. But that, like I said, that's another story. Oh, that was the last one. Um, the car was extremely tunable. Um, as Kenneth was saying, the gentleman's agreement was 270 some horsepower well in this time people were getting these cars the economy was crazy there everybody had money they were buying these cars tuning them to the moon and crashing and so that's kind of another big part of the gentleman's agreement was we're trying to be safer on the road limit horsepower once they buy the car they can do whatever they want so at that point some manufacturers put restrictor plates you know tighten the carburetor down, whatever, restriction. And so they didn't quite produce the power. But in that time, these manufacturers were building legends. I mean, 
the RB26 engine itself is capable of 600 horsepower by without any tuning. I mean, you could replace internals and get a thousand. Uh, I mean, they were just insane. Toyota did the same thing with the Supras, um, which is still why they're uh, an iconic car. Um, yeah, I, I guess is there, do you have anything else? Thing to do at this point to show you how fantastic uh, this car really is, is to start it. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and let Zane do that. We're gonna go ahead and pop the hood and uh, start it. Okay, everybody can hear me now. All right, there we go. Okay, so we're going to let it just warm up for a second real quick so we're not cold revving it. I would talk right now, but I don't want to. That just ruins it. Okay, so this is this car in particular is not stock. It does have a Nismo front mount intercooler. It does have uh, an aftermarket exhaust system, I believe, from the Catback. Uh, so it is going to be. It's going to sound a little better. Uh, thanks to America, we have catalytic converters right off the turbos, basically all the way to the driver's seat. So. <laughs> It's a little quieter. Mechanical Beethoven. It uh, also does have uh, early 2000s lids uh, blow off valves. It's got two of them. Uh, they are right behind uh, this front part of the bumper. Okay, I'm just gonna enjoy that for a minute. All right, so again, thank you very much for coming. Zane and I are gonna hang out for a little bit. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to ask. We'll open the doors, we'll open the trunk, we'll let you take a look around. It's a fantastic piece of JDM history. This is a car that growing up, like Zane said, I would grind on Gran Turismo to save money, to buy one of these driving that stupid little Honda Civic for forever so I could save up the money to buy one of these. And if you bought one in Gran Turismo, you bought it in Midnight Purple. And when I found out that the museum was going to have the opportunity to get one of these and then show it to everybody, I never thought in my life I'd be able to see one of these in person, let alone stick my head in it, let alone rev this thing. This is, this is, this is a dream for a JDM nerd like myself, you know. I, I've, I'm a JDM car guy. I've got a tattoo of a purple turbo on the inside of my left leg. So uh, I appreciate you guys coming to the museum. Cannot thank you enough for showing up. Have a look around. Enjoy it. And please, please come back.